Broadway and Grant Streets in Myersdale. And it is um, Wednesday, August the 16th, 2023. And we are opening the house today before it switches hands to some visitors who will be touring the home later. But thank you for tuning in to watch us here. I'm Jennifer Bear Pearl. I'm the Myersdale Public Library's archivist. And I first want to thank Vicki and Jean Brown, the current homeowners, for opening the place to us today before the home switches hands later this month. And I also need to thank all of the volunteers um, who are joining us here today. There are a number of people who have stepped up to volunteer without whom we wouldn't have made possible this day. So we of course want to thank them. We always appreciate our volunteers. This home um, was um, constructed in 1869, finished in 1870. And um, the pioneer Olinger who came to this area in 1776, John Olinger, was the grandfather of John M. Olinger who constructed the home. This is a copy of the original land warrant that John Olinger, grandfather John Olinger, um, obtained in Harrisburg in 1786, prior to Somerset County being formed out of Bedford County in 1795. A number of years ago, Regis Miller, a Myersdale native, donated the original land warrant to the Myersdale Area Historical Society, and these are copies that we keep on display at the Historical Society, located at the top of Main Street. We brought them down here um, today for display. Um, John Olinger's son, Jacob Olinger, who's pictured here, was the father of the man who constructed this home. And Jacob Olinger spent his um, time here in Myerstow, and he had a farm. At, at, if we go back to the early 1800s, this was a farm owned by the Olingers. In 1844, Jacob laid out 10 plots of land along Main Street here in Myersdale, and they were sort of public auction. The uh, one that went for the highest amount was on the corner of Center and Main, where the old Mongol building used to be, and then in 1844 it sold for $195. A few years later, in 1852, Jacob um, partitioned off another 30 lots along North Street here in town. And the only words referred to this area of town at that part of time, point in time um, as several different names. Originally Fairfield, they later called it Coldale, and later on Dale City. Um, as the story goes, and it's pretty well known here around Myersdale, um, the borough was incorporated in 1874, and we're on the verge of celebrating the town's 150th anniversary of that incorporation. But um, the Myers and the Olingers kind of came to an agreement after some disagreement, and finally the um, court settled the issue and called the town Myers Dale, which is a combination of Myers Mills and Dale City. Um, Jacob would pass away in 1867 at the age of 75. Um, by that point in time, the late 1860s, most of the Olinger farm here had been nearly all laid out in lots. Um, so John, Jacob's son, built the home, as I mentioned, in the 1869 and 70, he and his wife Sarah. Sarah was a brewmaker from Berlin. They had married in 1863. Um, John briefly entered the banking business with Samuel D. Livingston. That was pretty short-lived. Um, their business lasted only about three years. Um, we actually have an old ledger in the library in our Pennsylvania Room archives. It dates back to 1870, when this was simply known as Dale City before its incorporation as Myersdale in 1874. And in that wonderful old ledger, which we're working to digitize and eventually share inside the Power Library, um, there's a census of the people who lived here in Dale City. John Olinger is here with his family, and he is listed as a speculator. So, um, it, it's we, the way we figure John made a lot of his money through land sell, sales, um, purchases, selling and purchasing land, and investing in those, in those land purchases. So, um, 
Rando Fry, who um, you'll watch his videos too, hopefully, as he talks about another owner of the home, George Foy, um, found an interesting story in an 1892 edition of the Myersdale commercial. And it talks about um, the evening that year when there were three burglars here in Myersdale wreaking some havoc. They came to this home and they tried to rob it. But John would have nothing of it, as the story goes. He um, opened up his revolver. Well, no. uh, he, didn't, he didn't manage to hit any of them. They, they fled up to Center Street, where they had a shootout with the local sheriff. And again, they still got away. We didn't have time to research whether or not they were ever caught, but it's an interesting story nonetheless. Now, John and Sarah, his wife, would have seven children. Um, and two of them, unfortunately, died in childhood. There's an interesting story tied in with all of that that we discovered in the Pennsylvania room just yesterday. Um, one of my volunteers, Barbara, was doing some accessioning work, and she was, one of the items she was accessioning was a little album, maybe measured about two, three inches, um, just a tiny little album, it was donated to us a few years ago in the Methodist Church here in Myersdale Close. And it's a memorial album dedicated to a little 11-year-old girl named Elizabeth or Lizzie Moss. And in this tiny little booklet, people would write memorials toward Lizzie, who had died of diphtheria in 1879. And as I was paging through this album yesterday, I came across an entry by none other than Annie Fullinger. And Annie was John and Sarah's oldest child. She would have been about 15 years old at the time. And in that album dedicated to Lizzie, she wrote, In memory of Lizzie Maul, While to the grave our friends are born, Around their hold remains. How all the tender passions mourn, And each fond heart contains. By a friend, Myersdale, December 23rd, 1879, and then Annie's signature is down in the corner of the album. And what's really poignant about this story is the fact that um, Annie probably didn't know at the time when she was penning that little memorial for her friend Lizzie that within the next two months she would lose two of her own siblings to the same disease. Um, John and Frank, or John and um, Sarah's other son, um, Frank, would die of the disease at age 13 um, on February 17th of 1880. And his younger sister, Sadie, who was only five at the time, preceded him in death at age five by diphtheria. So obviously um, that disease was making the rounds here in Myersdale at the time and a number of children, there are three that we, we immediately know of, um, who passed away from the illness. So, um, John M. would live here in the home until 1913, when he died at the age of 77 years old. And the Myersville Republican reported on his death. Um, he died of, pretty suddenly of acute indigestion. The newspaper notes he went to church that evening. The family were devout members of Myersdale's Main Street Brethren Church. And um, he went to church Sunday evening. He woke up Monday and felt pretty well. But then by um, the day's end, he started to feel worse. He took to his bed. And at 8.20 that Monday evening, he passed away. And the newspaper wrote very highly of him. They noted that he was one of Myersdale's oldest and most respected citizens. Um, they referred to him as a devoted husband and father, a kind friend and neighbor. They also pointed out that for nearly four score years, he lived almost entirely on the very spot where he was born, and he was known to everyone. The best we can figure, John would have been born right over on North Street in a home that his mother and father, Jacob and Catherine, constructed. And that house actually still stands today. Um, it's a log house underneath the siding. So John had lived in the yellow house prior to building this home, and um, in Linda Redman's segment, she tells you a little bit about the yellow house that was located a little ways out of town here, headed toward Garrett. Um, as I mentioned earlier, he and Sarah had married in 1863. The newspaper article in the Republican upon his death notes that she was his 
constant helpmate and companion up until the time of his death. An interesting story related to their marriage in 1863 was that they took their honeymoon trip to Chambersburg. Uh, at that point in time, as you know, we were in the midst of the Civil War, and Jacob and, or I'm sorry, John and Sarah actually traveled to Chambersburg so he could register for the draft. But he was turned away because of um, his poor physical condition, so he never served in the military. Um, the newspaper upon his death went on to note that John was of a quiet, unobtrusive nature, and he preferred the comforts of his home above all other pleasures. So he, from what we've learned, really enjoyed his time spent here on the corner of Broadway and Grant Street. He was an excellent citizen, always interested in the welfare of his town and community, but never seeking to take a prominent part in its public affairs. He was known for the sound advice and wise counsel he offered to others. And the modest, soft-spoken, kindly disposed old gentleman, who was such a familiar figure on the streets of Myersdale, will be missed, not only in his home and church, but from the entire neighborhood. Um, I mentioned earlier that they were members of the Nyersdale's Main Street Brethren Church, which was dedicated here in 1910. And um, inter a few interesting facts about the Olingers with that church is that the Olinger children actually donated half of the cost toward the pipe order, organ in honor of their parents, and Andrew Carnegie had contributed the other half of the funds. The um, building was dedicated in March of 1910, that church building, and on Christmas Day in 1910, John Olinger paid off the balance of the debt owed toward that building, and that was noted in his obituary. Um, you might remember, I know that John had passed away on a Monday evening, and his son John was actually on the way to Cuba at the time of his father's passing. So as you might imagine, in the year 1913, it took a little while to notify the son for him to get back here. So John's body laid in state here in the home. We suspect in this room, because we suspect this would have been the parlor at the time, and his body laid in state here until Saturday morning. And the newspaper article notes that hundreds of people came into the home to pay their respects, and they all commented on the good job that Undertaker Wright had done. And then on Saturday morning, the newspaper notes it was a gloomy, grisly morning. The um, funeral processed from the home up to Union Cemetery, where they, all of the, most of the owners are buried, with the exception of one, and then eventually to the Main Street Brethren Church. And there are two of John's favorite songs, What a Friend We Have in Jesus and Rock of Ages, were sung. An interesting note about the home, um, we delved into some of our old Sanborn fire insurance maps, and we have one map from 1910 and another from 1919, and keep in mind, John passed away in 1913, and it's interesting to note on those Sanborn maps that in 1910, there were a good number of outbuildings that surrounded the home here. But then shortly after John's death in 1913, we found a newspaper advertisement in the Republican, and Sarah, his wife, was advertising the barn here on the property for sale, noting that it was at a reasonable cost and would be easy to move. And in 1919, the next Sanborn map that we were able to access, it is um, revealed that there's only one outbuilding remaining on the property, and that's the garage, which still stands today here on the property. But it seems that after John's death in 1913, they disposed of a lot of the outbuildings, so that's an interesting note. And you can actually view the Sanborn maps um, off of our library's website if you have a library card. All right, we will process um, next into the library where we'll talk about a little bit about the um, events that the Olinger women hosted in this home through the years.